okay so good evening friends i hope uh, all of you had a good exam for neat pg 21 20 uh, two probably right so may 22 and i hope uh, the exam was more comfortable the paper was a very standard paper so i hope uh, you know most of you have done well so what i'll do is i'll just uh, give a quick recall of all the radiology questions uh, that came in there was a lot of uh, questions on radiology in an integrated fashion we had very less questions in this general radiology part but we had a lot of questions asked in uh, systemic radiology and especially euro radiology was heavily tested in this uh, exam so let's uh, you know briefly understand what are the different options and the questions right that had come in this exam. Look at the first question here. A six-year-old child presented with recurrent UTI and what is the most likely diagnosis? So it's a young child with recurrent UTI. So whenever you are suspecting, you know, whenever you have a young patient with recurrent UTI, you should always look for structural abnormalities, right? So you should always suspect some kind of, you know, structural abnormalities. And in the image, they had given you a bladder which is contrast opacified and the contrast was getting refluxed into the bilateral ureters. So this was a case of vesicouretric reflux, vesicouretric reflux. So let us try to understand what are the other options given. One option was what is this kind of images if you get, okay. So MCU, mixtration cystic showing bilateral reflex, that is easy to identify. But what is these images, if you're getting images something like this. So when you see images like this, where you see the contrast opacified bladder, but adjacent to it, you see small outpouches. This is how you have your bladder diverticulum, right. So this is how your bladder diverticulum, right. So very different from your uh, vesicouretric reflux. I hope uh, you were, you know, getting it right. So let me see, hope you are all able to, the, this kind of images if you get, okay. the live chat, I am not able to see. Okay. Fine, just share me the live chat thing, okay. Okay, so this is a bladder diverticulum. And the other thing is, you know, when you have bilateral diverticulum like this in the bladder, this is what is called as a Mickey Mouse appearance. So Mickey Mouse appearance, Mickey Mouse appearance this is seen when you have a bilateral bladder diverticulum so bladder diverticulum are small out poachings right so they are small out poachings like that from the bladder and they will show this thing whereas the image that was given was a vesicuratory reflux that would seen on a mcu mixtration stereotography and what is this image you are seeing there is a contrast opacified bladder and here the contrast is not going back into the ureters instead it is coming into your sigmoid colon so this is how you have your vesicocolic fistula. So vesicocolic fistula would be when you have the contrast from the bladder going into the sigmoid colon or the adjacent colon. So that is vesicocolic fistula. And uh, what is this image here? In this image, you can see a contrast opacified bladder and this is outpouching into the inguinal area. And this is how you have your bladder hernia. So the options also you need to remember these images for future exams. So this is how you have your bladder hernia. This is how you have your vesico, you know, colic fistula. This is how you have a bladder diverticulum. And it's very different from a very high grade vesicuretric reflux that you are seeing in these images. Now let's look at the next question. The next question was a delayed intravenous urogram of the patient and what is the likely diagnosis? Is it a staghorn calculi? Is it a putti kidney, pelureteric junction obstruction or a renal cyst? Now, the image showed a dense, no, uh, the image showed a dense collection in the left kidney, whereas the right kidney, it was showing the contrast going into the ureter and into the bladder, but you are having not much filling of the, okay, so you are having not much filling of the contrast in the left ureter. But the contrast was, you know, emptying from the right ureter only. So this is suggestive of a pelvic junction obstruction, PUJ obstruction. So when you see a PUJ obstruction, like when you have an obstruction at the pelvic junction, there will be a gross hydronephrosis. And when you give the contrast also, the contrast op opacifies these areas, right, and occupying most of the parenchyma there. So this is how you have your pelvic junction obstructions. And you need to differentiate it from a, you know, putti kidney. Putti kidney will be a homogeneous calcified kidney. Homogeneous calcified kidney. 
and this putty kidney would be having a history associated with sterile pyuria, right? This would suggest this is renal tuberculosis or a putty kidney. So, putty kidney is slightly different, right? It will be uh, calcified homogeneously ground glass like calcification that you see with a renal tuberculosis. And if it is very dense calcifications like, a, you know, a cement kidney, that would be a later stages where you have this uh, dense cement kidney. So, putty kidney would be more homogeneous and ground glass like appearance of the calcifications. And what is this? And this image where you are seeing that there is a calcific density, especially it will be taken on a plain radiograph, right? And even on a plain radiograph, you can see that there is a calcific density which takes the shape of the pelvis, right? Which narrows down along the pelvis and occupies at least two calicial system. So, a calcific density which takes the shape of the pelvis and has at least, you know, opacification of at least two calicial system. This is what we call as staghorn calculi. So, this is how we have a staghorn calculi. So, the image was, the image that came in the exam was of a pelvic junction obstruction. There was opacification in the left kidney without much, you know, contrast entering the left ureter. So, there was delayed emptying into the left ureter, suggestive of a pelvic junction obstruction. The next question that were asked was a 25 year old female with infertility underwent hysterosalpinography. The image is given. What is the likely diagnosis? Now, this is a 25 year old female and she is having infertility. And this is an important clue. And also, the HSD image showed that there is a two cornua, but the intercornual angle was narrow. So, when we have a narrow intercornual angle, when we have a narrow interconval angle and commonly also with infertility is conval angle. This is mostly in favor of what? Septate uterus, septate uterus. In case of biconvate uterus, you would have a wide interconval angle. So, a narrow interconval angle, it is difficult to differentiate on a HSG images. But because infertility was given it, and also you have a narrow interconval angle, the better answer would be a septate uterus. Okay, septate uterus are more associated with infertilities. Now, you can see here in this image, what do you think is this image? Good evening, Satish, right? What do you think this is? What is this image showing you? This is uniconvate uterus, right? So, this is uniconvate uterus. And uh, what is this image showing you? What is this image showing you? This image where you see that there is contrast or pacification of both the conva, but there are two separate vaginal openings. This would be didelphus didelphus so if you have a two separate vagina with two separate uterine cavities this is how we have your didelphus didelphus so please remember this when you have two separate vagina and two separate uh, endometrial cavities that is didelphus okay now look at the next question fourth question a 30 year old male met with road traffic accident presents to the casualty with inability to pass urine right so there is a male with a road traffic accident inability to pass urine and there is also blood at the external urethral meatus rgu was performed what is the likely site of injury so you can see this is an rgu image showing this is your penile urethra this is your bulba urethra this part here posteriorly is the membranous urethra. What did you answer it as? What is this? Is this? He is asking you what is the likely site of urethral injury. So, a patient with RTA having blood at the external urethral meatus, you suspect a urethral trauma and you will do a RGU. Your foley says contraindicated, you will start with doing a RGU. On an RGU, what do you see the image as? Here you can see this curved area is a bulbar part. And the posterior part is the membranous part. So, this could be what? Membranous urethral injury. And if you had seen injury, if you have seen the contrast leaking out from the curved part or the bulbar part, that could be the bulbar urethral. So, you have to remember what the exact image was. You have seen the paper, but probably this is a membranous urethral injury. So, this is how you have to understand the parts of the urethra. So, this is the penile urethra. This is the penile urethra, right? The sponge urethra, the penile urethra. This is the bulba urethra. The curved part is the bulba urethra. This narrow part posteriorly, this is the membranous urethra, right? And then you have very close to the prostate gland. That would be your prostatic urethra, prostatic urethra. So, that is how we have different parts of the male urethra. And RGU, please remember RGU for two important conditions, okay, for your future exams. RGU is the investigation of choice for urethral trauma. It is an investigation of choice for urethral trauma. 
and also it is an investigation of choice for urethral strictures right urethral strictures and you should know the different parts of the male urethra the penile the bulba the membranous and the prostatic urethra right so the color coding here should help you with that next thing another question a simple question radiology was not very difficult in the exam right so it's very doable questions were given a middle aged male presents with acute onset pain in the right limb an investigation was performed what is the name of the investigation so they showed a you know color doppler image and they gave a spectral wave pattern and they have wanted you what is this investigation being done right so this is your ultrasound doppler a spectral doppler image was given which was showing this wave pattern okay the triphasic wave pattern in the peripheral arteries and monophasic pattern in the venous doppler so we did this in your spectral doppler studies in detail right so this is your ultrasound doppler imaging and another easy question one image they gave and asked what is this investigation is it a pet ct mdct cerebral flow study or a sesta maybe scan what do you think is the answer here the important clue to understand is look at the cortex the cortex of the bone is white so when the cortex of the bone is white this is what ct scan we can understand that is ct but look at the brain parenchyma in the brain parenchyma you can see a lot of you know uptake a hot area in the brain please remember the major major source of energy to the neurons is glucose and what do we give in in pet scan 18 fdg so that is the reason a lot of uptake happens in the brain parenchyma so when you are seeing uptake in the brain parenchyma that is 18 fdg pet scan so that is how you identify that this is a pet scan the isotope that must be used must be 18 fdg 18 fluorodeoxyglucose and you are also seeing the cortex of the bone white so this must be pet ct if there is uptake in the brain and the cortex of the bone is black that would be pet mri this is your pet ct image next question 11 month old child presents with recurrent abdominal pain on uh, examination a mass can be felt in the lumbar region a barium enema study was done what is the diagnosis and this was a very classic standard image that you study in your gi radiology this is a claw sign and this claw sign is feature of what intersusception i hope you got this right so this is intersusception and i want you to understand how mal rotation appears also right just to be you know aware of in the upcoming exams in mal rotation on a barium meal follow through you will see that there is a cock screwing of the duodenum there will be cock screwing of the duodenum and all these small intestinal loops they come and lie towards the right of the vertebra only the small intestinal loops you can see here all the jejunal and the ileal loops they are more on towards the right of the vertebra they are not much loops on the left side this is the mal rotation that is happening a cock screw duodenum and all these small intestinal loops lying towards the right of the vertebra this is how your barium meal follow through image of a mal rotation would be right next and uh, another is very standard okay routine question that had come a 30 year old patient met with road traffic accident he is having bruising over the chest and he is uh, having a pulse rate which is high blood pressure is low right his tachypneic and the chest x-ray is performed what is the appropriate step in the management and the x-ray showed absent bronchovascular marking right visceral pleural reflection absent bronchovascular marking all of this suggests there is a pneumothorax and you can see the trachea being shifted to the opposite side there is a slight mediastinal shift also so this is tension pneumothorax so this is tension pneumothorax and in tension pneumothorax you should put a white bore needle followed by a chest tube so chest tube insertion and drainage should be the treatment here okay so that is important to understand tension pneumothorax tension pneumothorax should not be a radiological diagnosis tension pneumothorax should be a clinical diagnosis okay it should be a clinical diagnosis when you see absent uh, breath sounds on auscultation so circulatory collapse is there in the patient right so there is a history of trauma absent breath sound on auscultation circulatory collapse it is tension pneumothorax put the white bone needle followed by the chest tube right uh, getting a radiograph is a bad decision okay tension pneumothorax should be a clinical diagnosis next thing they gave another question here they said uh, a patient had uh, complaints of recurrent swelling on one side of the neck she is afraid of eating food as she has worsening of the swelling imaging is performed and what is a likely diagnosis so they gave a image showing the floor of the mouth and there was a calcific density on the radiograph at the floor of the mouth and this is how sallow lithiasis would be okay so this is how sallow lithiasis would be 
right so it is not uh, in the mandible okay it was just adjacent to the mandible especially in the uh, region of the submandibular gland or the parotid gland you will see this calcific densities called as sallolithiasis right so this is sallolithiasis that you have and this is some standard question we had here and uh, this is you know we repeatedly tell in the exams the age group of 2 to 3 year old child when he has a lucent or a opaque hemithorax, whenever a 2 to 3 year old child coming with sudden respiratory distress, right? So, whenever you have a 2 to 3 year old child with sudden onset of respiratory distress and the chest radiograph showing a lucent or a opaque hemithorax, always the first thing that you should suspect is a foreign body. Now, so once he said that there is a right hemithorax which is more lucent, the left lung is normal, the child is having a sudden onset of respiratory uh, distress, right? What should be the what is the correct statement about this condition? The localized area of dilation highly suggests of a foreign body removed with flexible bronchoscopy. Focal area of decreased air entry confirms the diagnosis. Incomplete obstruction balval mechanism leads to such condition. Preferred way of removal is by rigid bronchoscopy. Now, uh, localized areas of dilated dilatations, this could be blebs, right? So, this could be uh, features so you know bullet also right so it's not important that always it will be localized especially whenever we have a, a proximal bronchial obstructions you will have a lucent and the question says it's a lucent hemithorax right the entire lucent hemithorax is there it's more of a proximal thing so a complete lucent hemithorax or opaque hemithorax should make you think of foreign bodies and uh, more than flexible bronchoscopy we go for a rigid bronchoscopy for removal of foreign bodies focal area of decreased air entry confirms the diagnosis right it could be uh, you know a collapse when you have decreased air entry in that area or you could also have a lucent hemithorax so both a lucent or a opaque hemithorax a foreign body can cause both a lucent or opaque hemithorax and whenever it is in the proximal areas when it is a lucent hemithorax you expect a more proximal obstruction and uh, incomplete obstruction ball ball mechanism leads to such condition now whenever we have a obstruction which is complete right so this will cause collapse of this lung but if we have a partial obstruction like a you know bell valve so air is about to come in but not allowed to go out so this will lead to a lucent hemithorax air trapping will happen right there will be air trapping on the expiratory flame causing a lucent hemithorax so that is how we will have when we have a bell valve mechanism so it is not a complete obstruction it should have to be a partial obstruction to produce a bell valve mechanism a complete obstruction would produce a complete collapse of that lo lobe of the lung or the uh, that side of the lung okay it's, it involves the primary bronchus the entire lung would be collapsed if it is involving a secondary bronchus that lobe would be affected so a complete obstruction will not cause bell valve a partial obstruction would cause a bell valve and hyperinflated lungs on or air trapping on expiratory flames so the better answer here should be your know, removing with a rigid bronchoscopy because he's having a lucent hemithorax i'm expecting a more proximal obstruction in the proximal bronchus and a rigid bronchoscopy would be more better right is this clear now look at the next one a 35 year old alcoholic male presented with severe abdominal pain rigidity and vomiting his vitals are stable. What is the effective way to treat this patient? And a radiograph was given. And this radiograph is also something which all of you must be knowing. This is what? Air under diaphragm. There was no option like rigid bronchoscopy. Then if rigid bronchoscopy is not there, you can go for flexible bronchoscopy, right? So flexible bronchoscopy. If rigid bronchoscopy was not there, you can go for flexible bronchoscopy. If that is there, that is good. If that is not there, then flexible bronchoscopy. Most of the people are saying it was not there. We can go for a flexible bronchoscopy. If, especially when you are having, you know, distal airway obstructions, we go for flexible. And when we have more proximal obstructions, we go for rigid bronchoscopy. So depending on, you know, what was given in the options. Next. Okay. A 35-year-old alcoholic male presented with severe abdominal pain, rigidity and vomiting. His vitals are stable. What is the most effective way to treat this patient? So here you are having an alcoholic male with abdominal pain, rigidity, vomiting and a chest radiograph is given. And here it's classically air under diaphragm, especially under the right dome of diaphragm. Air under right dome of diaphragm. This is what? A pneumoperitoneum. This is pneumoperitoneum. And for a pneumoperitoneum, right, what would you do? Or a hollow viscous perforation? you have to go for a exploratory laparotomy. So, it's important to resuscitate the patient, right, put IV fluids, IV lines and get a exploratory laparotomy done. So, this is exploratory laparotomy. Another question which is, you know, which is caused due to rupture of saccular aneurysm. So, this was simple. This is subarachnoid hemorrhage. Do you remember the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is trauma actually. The most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is trauma. 
and if they ask you most common cause of spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage this is rupture of aneurysm or the saccular aneurysm rupture of aneurysm the worst headache of his life right all that thing would be subarachnoid hemorrhage and do remember the investigation of choice for acute subarachnoid hemorrhage should be non contrast ct scan non contrast ct scan right so that is important next another simple question a patient with fever and breathlessness night sweats dry cough and just radiograph shows bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy so when you see a patient having features similar to tuberculosis fever weight loss night sweats and bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy the answer should be what sarcoidosis sarcoidosis so bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy is feature of what sarcoidosis you study bilateral hilar and right paratracheal lymph nodes are features of sarcoidosis right so this was sarcoidosis next a hypertensive patient with poor compliance with sudden onset of breathlessness and uh, chest x-ray is given what is the preferred treatment in such case so if you see the chest radiograph the chest radiograph shows this classic perihilar confluent opacities these are called as batwing opacities batwing opacities right so why not a now hypersensitivity pneumonitis this is more of a farmer organic dust exposure right organic dust exposure would be there and you would have mosaic attenuation right so on uh, there should be something given like you know there are mosaic areas or mosaic attenuation all of that would mean hypersensitivity pneumonitis bilateral hilar lymph nodes is classic right for sarcoidosis anyways so batwing opacities no furosemide in the options okay so you know this looks like more of mi leading to pulmonary edema right so sudden onset of chest pain breathlessness right so think of you know mi with uh, pulmonary edema you can go for iv nitroglycerin if furosemide was not given i hope it was you know mentioned but if not uh, remember uh, furosemide and uh, morphine these are drugs which can shift the fluid from pulmonary circulation to systemic circulation otherwise nitroglycerin we use in patients with you know suspected mi's right so we can use that also right only nitroglycerin fine so nitroglycerin should be the better answer next okay next what did you answer for this a 60 year old male presented with fever expectorations and difficulty breathing hrct chest was performed what is the diagnosis and the hrct showed this area of consolidation in the right lower lobes showing this classic lucencies within the bronchi right so this is classic air bronchogram so this is consolidation with air bronchogram involving the right lower lobes right so this is very simple right you need to differentiate how to differentiate ground glass opacity and consolidation a ground glass opacity will be area of haziness with lot of vascular markings seen through it and so in a ggo you will see vascular marking in vascular marking are seen in consolidation you don't see vascular marking in a consolidation no vascular marking and right and you see air bronchograms as you are seeing these are your air bronchograms that you see air within the bronchi this is suggest your what consolidation right so consolidation next and there was one more question of a patient having multiple you no know, long bone fractures they gave a question of a multiple long bone fractures and uh, antenatal fractures prenatal fractures they mentioned right so there were multiple antenatal fractures and what was that multiple long bone fractures antenatal fractures so especially transverse diaphyseal fractures if you have a transverse diaphyseal fracture that is suggestive of osteogenesis imperfecta whereas in this image the second image here the arrow is pointing towards a small metaphyseal corner fracture and in which condition do you see a metaphyseal corner fracture this would be a battered baby syndrome or a non accidental injury so it's very very important to differentiate these two conditions both of them are young child with uh, multiple fractures at various stages of healing both children will be very young childs with multiple fractures in the long bones at various stages of healing how to differentiate osteogenesis imperfecta from a battered baby syndrome or the non accidental injury is important osteogenesis imperfecta this will have multiple diaphyseal long bone fractures okay especially in the diaphysis transverse fractures would be there whereas in case of 
you know non accidental injuries or battered baby syndrome you have metaphyseal corner fractures only towards the corners of the metaphyseal okay when, when you are shaking the baby towards the metaphyseal ends you will have the fractures another difference is in osteoarthritis is imperfect obviously they'll give you other findings like your blue sclera they may give you dentigerous imperfecta right so problem with dentition whereas those things are not there in case of a uh, battered baby syndrome another important clue radiographically right so which i want you to understand and remember also is in osteoarthritis imperfecta as you can see in the images also the bone mineral density is normal the bone mineral density is normal in cases of in cases of uh, battered baby syndrome but in osteoarthritis imperfecta right this have weak bones right the bone mineral density is less osteoarthritis imperfecta you can see like you know loose and bones are there in osteoarthritis imperfecta there is loose and bones the bone mineral density is less in battered baby syndrome this is a normal child who is being beaten so his bone mineral density is normal so bone mineral density is decreased in osteoarthritis imperfecta bone mineral density is normal in cases of battered baby syndrome so these were these two things right and any other thing any other just the ultrasound finding was mentioned okay so only antenatal scan i just wanted to you know just explain that topic also so that was osteoarthritis imperfecta antenatal scan showing fractures is feature of osteoarthritis imperfecta you don't see that in a battered baby syndrome so this uh, antenatal fracture is important differentiation also between your osteoarthritis imperfecta and your battered baby syndrome presence of antenatal fractures is osteoarthritis imperfecta right and uh, there was any other question yeah history was there yeah i just make, kept you to you know have an idea about it right how we differentiate osteoarthritis imperfecta and the battered baby syndrome so if they mention antenatal fractures obviously it is osteoarthritis is imperfecta right fine guys okay so i hope okay we have got most of the questions right we have discussed all of these in our sessions right i'll share you the things even the loose and hemithorax question the questions on you know how to look at consolidation the standard pneumoperitoneum pneumothorax i hope all of you have done, done that right and uh, wishing all of you right you know get good scores and uh, good results stay positive and uh, hopefully you know you'll have good results and uh, we'll join your post graduation soon right all the best thank you so much guys and any queries you try in didel first you try in didel first we have two separate vagina right so two separate uh, vagina if you have didel first biconvate the intercornual angle will be very wide septate the intercolonal angle will be narrow and infertility more commonly you know if you can go with septate it is a better answer because it's infertility was mentioned it's actually difficult to differentiate septate from uh, uh, bicon